again, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Self Care Sunday. Today, I'm joined by six beautiful women of all ages and different backgrounds, and we're going to be discussing our experiences in being um, African American women in America. And today, I know with everything that's been going on with Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, that we have been protesting and really just letting our voices be heard. So today, we're going to have a conversation about the issues that we face in our own community, um, our individual lives. And uh, my first question is going to go to Tanya. So Tanya, how do you feel and what was your response really to what happened with Breonna Taylor? So when it comes to Breonna Taylor, um, that really hit close to home because I can resonate with a young lady close to my age, sitting at home with her significant other. Um, and being in the safety and comfort of your own home, you would assume that that's where your safe is. Um, to know that some the police was able to enter her home without any notice and because her significant other both of them were startled in the middle of the night and her significant other her boyfriend you know he had he had right to carry he shot a warning shot and that proceeded to more than 20 shots being fired into that home killing this young lady and it, it, it just really did not sit well with me till this day i just feel like the reason why we're not seeing a justice justice for her has to do with the fact that it was not reported um the cameras were the body cameras were turned off um and i think that was intentional um to just not show that what exactly was happening um so it really hit close to home to know that someone of that someone around the same age group was in the safety of her own home. There was no, it's not like you were at the wrong place at the wrong time. There was no way that anyone could say that. Um, and to know that her life has been taken and there's been no justice for her. So, um, you know, I, I continue to pray for justice for her and that those officers are arrested, convicted and, um, and spend their time in prison for what they've done. Completely agree with that, um, Marisol. Do you have anything to add? Uh, I, I agree with you. Um, it's just so much to to process sometimes when you you see things like that and you try to figure out like how is this how is this happening? You know, um, that could have been me. And the injustice that's happening in our country right now it's it's unbearable to to witness. And to be a part of that in this generation, this time. So I, I really agree um, with everything you just said. It's just I pray for her too, for her justice and for the police officers to reap the consequences of their actions. And hopefully, you know, this system changes and we could really make change now to moving forward because this has to stop. Thank you. Anyone else have anything to add? Um, to Shona, I do want to add that um, one of the things that we've seen of the outcome of Breonna Taylor's murder was that the no-knock warrant has is no longer, it can no longer um, take place. Um, but such a mistake, that's what it's being called a mistake, because the person that they were actually seeking the arrest for was already in police custody. So the fact that this young woman's life um, was taken by accident, I, I just feel that it's just unjustified and undignified the fact that there's not bigger measures being taken. You passing a law and those officers not being behind bars just doesn't seem fair. Um, and it's just not enough. So I just wanna add that these are the laws that protect officers or just people when they do things that are not right, um, that they feel protected behind, that they know they've done something wrong, but they can get away with it because these laws stand behind them. So that's just very disheartening when you have these um, laws that stand behind bad behavior. I totally agree. Um, LaRonda, you wanted to add something? I just wanna add, you know, Easily, how Marisol said that, you know, this can happen to anybody. It really can because I experienced something, not nothing because of my husband or myself, but I lived in an apartment where someone lived before where it was a warrant out for their arrest. 
you know, my husband and I just came home and, you know, banging, banging, banging down the door. And I mean, you open the door and like, they just push themselves in the house. You know, my husband's like, you know, like, what's going on? And, like, you're not even looking for me. But that could have easily escalated into something else. Mind you, this was the NYPD in Yonkers. But it's scary to think, like, wow, that could have actually happened to me. You know, anybody. Like, anybody could run a warrant for anybody. And that's, this is not the first time that's happened. I can't remember the young gentleman's name, but the same thing happened to him. You know, so very easily... This can happen to anybody, and it's sad. I completely agree with that. So the question really is, at the end of the day, um, do you think that this would have happened if she were not African-American? Anyone can answer that. Um, I'll chime in to Shauna. Um, I have a lot of uh, opinions about it. I do think it could have happened if she wasn't African-American, but I think the response to it would have been, um, you know, Maybe they wouldn't have been criminal charges right away, but they probably would have been fired right away. The judge who signed the no-knock order probably would have faced some kind of repercussions as well. Um, but it just goes back to, I think it was Tanya that said, it's not, it's not necessarily anything other than the system that protects these officers, because for all we know, they could have been really good officers who, you know what I mean? Had good track records and really did look out for their communities but it's a system behind it that made it okay for them to barge in someone's house in the middle of the night, not fact check to ensure that, you know, the person they wanted was already in custody and, you know, it happened and it's just like, yeah, you know, it's just another death um, in, by law enforcement for an African-American woman in a long list of men. So I think it could have happened to anybody, but I just think the response to it would have been much better, much more dignified if she was an African American. Um, I'm thinking about that. A part of me feels like I I wouldn't see that happening to a white woman. You know, I wouldn't see that happen to a white woman. I feel like if you go back to the systemic racism that is rooted in our country and how the police are set up for continually. Um, enslaving, killing, you know, incarcerating black people. I feel like some of these officers are like on the hunt and they're targeting black communities, black people. Um, just watching some of the videos of the way some of the, you know, the victims died and how they did it. It was a setup. It wasn't an accident. These weren't good cops just going in saying, oh, oh my God, what happened? Like what happened to the um, the kid Elijah, walking home from the store, and he's saying, "I'm just I'm just an introvert. This is just how I am. I, I I would never do anything like that." And then they just, you know, slam him on the ground and, you know, dump all these drugs in him and basically murder him. And then you see the cop talking to the other cop like, "You're going to be a witness." Like, you know, it seems like they have their own crew. Like there's a certain crew, in in every uh, state, and they're all down. With, with some kind of uh, racist group or hate crime group, and they go out and they target black people. And just like you said, because how, about how our system is set up, it protects them because it was never changed from back some, since slavery time. They just, you know, made it look like it was a cover up. Like, no, we're still gonna slave them. We still have them, you know, incarcerated. They're still working for the big pharma com companies and. You know, it's all this going going on right in front of our faces, but kind of behind our backs in a way. But now it's, you know, coming to the forefront because we have the cameras and we can see things more. But yeah, I, I don't think it would have, I don't see it happening to a white woman. I really don't. Thank you for that. Um, does anyone else have anything else they would like to add? Yeah, I actually want to piggyback off Marisol. Um, I couldn't agree more. I. I I can't see that happening to a white woman. And when you think about white supremacy, how it's infiltrated um, law enforcement, that's, that's the primary reason why I, I don't see that happening because you've seen time and time again, the way that um, African Americans are treated when they're being arrested. Um, it's just overly aggressive and, um, there's no sympathy, there's no empathy. Um, 
there is very little that just is very little connection where you're trying to actually listen to what that person is saying is like complete disregard for what that person is saying or for their life um so i i do think that it it can happen but i don't see it happening in that way um the way it did to brianna taylor where there were 20 shots um fired off into someone's home in the middle of the night and the the fact that witnesses can say that they did not hear law enforcement say police prior to coming into the whole, the household um the fact that there's just contradictions in the story it just makes me believe that although they had the warrant to go into that household they may have not done it in the right way and there's a reason why they did not do it um in the way that they were supposed to so um i just think that when we think about systemic racism and um, white supremacy it it has um, made its way into law enforcement for a long time and we're seeing that play out every single time we watch the news every time we see these videos of African Americans being treated unfairly during an arrest something when you get stopped for a, a traffic violation it should not turn into a life or death situation I think we see that more often than none that African Americans, it always turns into, not always, but for the most part, it turns into where someone is, a, a, your gun is drawn, your hand is on the trigger for you not stopping at a, a red light or is not stopping at a stop sign. So I just think that it's instilled in them and it's been allowed for so long um, when it comes to police officers, not all, but some, that it's very hard to break a habit that you're used to. Thank you. I agree with that for sure, for sure. Okay, so let's switch gears up a little bit. Um, we're going to discuss uh, colorism as African American women of all shades. I know that um, if we look all the way back from slavery to now, um, how our color has really, our shade, I should say, has really played a part in how we treat each other, how we feel about each other, and how they uh, um, look at us and how we are identified. So I actually want to direct this question to Dana first. Um, as far as colorism, um, do you feel that you have been treated uh, better because of your complexion or worse because of it? Um, so I'll give a two-part answer. Um, so I remember growing up, I, growing up, I'd say I was treated better because of it by my family. Um, so I have family members. So my, my, okay, I'll just give a little background. My father's side of the family, they were, they were white. Um, my mother's like she does have some white family members but for the most part her mother's black her father's black um, so I, what I will say is that in my family you know there was favoritism based on my complexion from my family members um, I don't feel that I was treated favorably like in school um, peers and things like that um, but I can, like, if I'm going to be 100% honest, it, it was definitely was some from my family. Not like my immediate family. I'm not talking about my mom, my dad. I'm talking about, like, maybe aunts, grandparents, uncles, et cetera. Thank you. Uh, Shante, would you like to add anything to that? Do you feel that you were treated uh, better or worse because of your complexion? Um, I, I would say I was treated um, worse than um, the other light-skinned people because um, right now, I was, I was a little darker than this, you know, grow, not growing up, but being in Jamaica and in the sun all the time, you're dark skin, you get blacker, blacker. So I was pretty much like always the black sheep, oh, she's so black, just so ugly. And I wouldn't, it, it affected me, but I grew up out of it. In school, it was a, uh, I say elementary school, junior high school is oh ugly monkey, that and then when I got to high school, it's saw, oh you're pretty for a black dark skin girl. So I'm like what? <laughs> I'm like what is that? Is that's not a compliment? <laughs> so that's that's it. <laughs> okay. Does anyone else have anything to add? I, I do actually. So I want to piggyback off. Shantae because that statement that she just made that you're pretty for a, a dark-skinned girl 
is something that I've heard and it was intended to be a compliment. And so I remember when I was in high school, someone said that to me and I didn't know how to feel. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to be like offended or if I was supposed to um, take it as a compliment. But what I will say is that colorism is a internal, um, it's an internal issue of the black community that we see oftentimes that happens not only with our families, but when you're in, when you're outside your household and you're in school or you're just in out, you're just outside that you have to deal with. Um, and like Shantae said, as you continue to get older and you become more confident in yourself, it, it doesn't affect you as much. But when you're younger and you're impressionable and you're an adolescent, you can't help but take offense to what people are saying about you when it's not something you have control over. Like you don't have control over what color you are. Um, I'm also Jamaican and my mom is um, half Cuban. So she's light skin. My dad is dark skin and just, you know, certain comments from people that may know my mom, like, why are you not as light as your mom? Like making it seem like being lighter is better. Um, but as you continue to grow older, you see that it really doesn't matter what color you are. As long as you feel beautiful, that's really what matters. But um, it is something that we do need to face as a Black community that it's, a, it's an ongoing issue. So colorism. This has been like a big issue with me growing up because obviously I am very fair. You see my daughter, she's very fair. But my problem growing up is that I always got treated better, no matter what. It's like, and it does begin within your family. So it's like within my family, I was the lightest person, but I am half Puerto Rican. You know, but I was raised black. I wasn't raised with my, the Puerto Rican side of my family. But it was always like, oh, call you a little white girl, or like, oh, you're so pretty. And you could be ugly, but just because you're light, it's like you're pretty. And it, it, it baffled my mind. Mama, it's like me and my cousin, Mama. we lived in the same house. We had the same length of hair. Our fathers are, are brothers, for God's sake. You know what I mean? But it's like I got everything. In elementary school, I got everything. It's because I was lighter. And black girls, black yeah. girls didn't want to be friends with me because it's like they felt like I thought I was better because I was white. So I didn't have any black friends. I had white friends. And growing up, I was really confused as, am I white or am I black? Because when you think of white, you think of light. When you think of black, you think of black. And the other thing is that they associate everything with black as being bad. Darkness, dirt, anything is bad, you know? So... Where to it needs to stop at is with the light skin joke. Or you're acting light skin. Like, what does that mean? Or they would tell you, well, I, I know you're not all black. Like, I can't be this light and be all black. Like, it's certain things, and it's in your family. Like, it, 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 it's, it's really disturbing because, you know, like, once I got to... My godmother, let me say this. I'm, I'm getting a little confused. My godmother is an activist, okay? I, at the point when I was confused, she took me and was like, look, she immersed me. She threw everything black at me. Like, you're going to read all these black books. You are black. I don't care what nobody tells you. You are black. So once I got out of elementary school, you know, I was like, all right, I'm black. So I started liking that, more, that side of me more because I hated being black. And I'm going to be honest with you. Because, like, I can't be black. I'm in the wrong family. Like, these people can't be my family. And my parents are, my mom is dark. Everybody in my family is dark. But it's like you feel like you do not belong. So you're trying to find your place. But it's like you're put all the way up here because you're light-skinned. And that is the craziest thing to me I've ever seen in my life. Like, I, 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 could, have, I could say so much to Sean on this, like, really? But I would <laughs> say something, but... It's crazy to me. And even in, in corporate America, same thing. I never had a problem getting a job. You know, I've never, uh, in corporate America, never had a problem doing that. I've worked for the state for years. 
But I got that job like one, two, three. And it definitely has to do with people looking at the, the color of your skin. Thank you, thank you for that. Does anyone else have anything that they would like to add? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll just express concern about how that gets perpetuated. Like, I, I don't know who the name of the person that spoke before me, but she said it, it starts in her family. And I definitely want to piggyback on that and say, yes, I 100% agree. But then you kind of have to look at like why, like where did this come from? Because uh, mm -hmm. in my experience, you know, I've had a lot of people say to me like, yeah, but it was the same thing when I was growing up. All right, and you know, you didn't like it, so why continue it? You know what I mean? So, it's like, like I wish you paid more as a community, more attention as a community to how that gets perpetuated. Thank you. Marisol? Yeah, I was gonna say something about that, of like, you know, like where does that come from? You know, knowing our history and seeing the divide and segregation and how we were always put against each other and how that continues in America, <laughs> um, along with the systemic racism, along with the media that's constantly telling you white is better, black is not, you know, to the point where you start feeling like, I should, should, should I look different? Maybe I should straighten my hair. Maybe I should do this. Maybe I should do that. And you have those ideas in your mind. And like she said, with family, I remember growing up, you know, um, always, they're always perming my hair, keeping it straight. And then when I wanted to like go natural and just let my natural hair just be itself, my, I remember my grandma, she told me, she says, that's ugly. Why, why would you wear your hair like that? No guy is ever going to want you looking like that. And I said, but it's my natural hair. It's the way it was, you know, how I was born this way. And she said, no, for you to look good, you have to straighten your hair. You have to look a certain way. And, you know, in order for us to like really change that, we have to look at where that came from and then start to realize that we, we are beautiful people. You know, we're beautiful regardless of the shade of our skin and realize that moving forward, you know, we could start to change that in our generations with the ch our children and the next generation, because, you know, that's tough to grow up and always feel like, you know, you hear the jokes in your family, like, oh, you know, you dark skin or, oh, you, you not light enough, like, oh, you right in the middle or you not, you know, so it's, it's a tough situation, but I think, um, you know, it starts with our families and changing that. Thank you. Um, I, I personally, myself, uh, being of a lighter complexion, I feel that, you know, honestly, this comes back from a time of slavery, um, a time when we were really pinned against each other in the sense of you being treated differently based on the shade you were, whether you were going to be inside or outside. And I think that that trickled down to through generations amongst African Americans as much as it trickled down amongst white America. Um, that the fact that we were lighter, even though we were still African American, there was some level of separation between us, that there was this idea that you're just somewhat better. You're not quite it, but you're somewhat better than darker. And the perception that the darker you were, the shade of complexion you were, the more angry you were, the more violent you were, the more dirty you were, the more unattractive you were. And I think that's just something that's really trickled down from slavery that we're still dealing with today. So with that being said, I'm going to, I'm going to switch up the context a little bit and um, basically ask all of you, any one of you can respond, is do you ever feel and have you ever felt pressure to be, to be white, to act like a white person, whatever that may mean? Have you ever felt pressure to do that, whether that's at work, whether that's at home in your own communities, but have you ever felt pressure to really try to pass as something that you're not? Well, I, I'm, I will say this to Shona. I wouldn't say I tried to pass as white, but I tried to prove my blackness more than anything. You know, I wanted people to know that I was like, like, I am black. I braided, I cornrowed my hair one time. And I remember someone telling me, oh, you're trying to, you're trying to be black? I'm like, I'm trying to be black. Like, what do you mean? It's like certain things that black girls did, like, I didn't want to do because, like, you're going to look at me like, oh, you're not even black. And I'm like, come on, people. You know, and it, like I said, it has to start with black people, with the light skin jokes. Like, it's offensive to me, you know, and it's annoying, you know, like, oh, yeah, yeah. like, it has yeah. to, I have wrote something down, but it has to 
start start with that. Like it has to start yeah. with us. Stop making us feel like we are inferior because we're not dark enough. You know, it, it, people do that. You know, I, I don't want to try to prove that I'm black. I can't get cornrows because I'm white and now I'm trying to be somebody I'm not when I'm really that person. You know, it's it's a two-way street. And like you said, it starts from there with people in, in slavery, everything thinking that white is right. And it's not. Like the little joke, they say light skin is the right skin. Black people started that. Like, why though? Like, why are you trying to put light skin black people against dark skin black people? Thank you, thank you. Anyone else would like to join in? Yeah, I, I wanted to piggyback off what she was saying, when she was saying why. And I think, you know, it's deeply rooted in our history. So it kind of just goes from generation to generation to generation to generation with this as a strategic system in place for us to be against one another based on the shades of our skin and amongst other things. Um, do you guys hear me? Oh, okay, sorry. I didn't know what that message said. Um, but to answer uh, to Shauna's question about, did you ever feel pressure to be white or act white? I never felt pressure to be that way. And what she was saying, it was almost not feeling accepted by my black family in a way. <laughs> I used to get picked on for the way that I talked or I sound when I was, you know, when I spoke to people. Um, like, you know, they would say, oh, you're just trying to be white or why do you sound like that? Why do you sound like your voice sounds so proper or, you know, or the way you, you dress sometimes or the way you act sometimes. It was almost like, you know, they will kind of say, oh, this person who was a white, white girl, like she's more black than you are. And it was like that kind of thing of like trying to make you feel less black or less accepted by, by my family. Like you're not, you're not black, you know? Um, so I think it was more of like feeling comfortable in my own skin, you know, with who I am and feeling like it's not one thing or the other. It's not acting white versus, you know, acting black, you know, if you're speaking and you're speaking proper, <laughs> it's just you're speaking proper. Doesn't mean you're, you're more proper because it's a white thing and black people don't know how to speak. So it's, it's a lot of things and layers to that. Does anyone else have anything to add? I do. Um, so I have two things to add. Um, so I just want to say something to um, the young lady that was um, that she's half Puerto Rican and half black and and um, she felt as if she was treated better and so I, I don't want to take away from her experience because I think every black woman's experience is different um, but what I will say is that um, I, I would never want her to feel inferior um, or superior to anyone. I would hope that we all feel equal. Um, but what I will say being that I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum that where she may have felt that she's been treated better being lighter skin, I don't necessarily feel that I've been treated worse, but I would say that it was not equivalent to someone of lighter skin tone. And so the things that she may have felt that were black jokes um, about being light-skinned, those same jokes are made towards darker-skinned black women or men about being dark-skinned, like, oh, you're, you're just too dark. Or I've heard men say things where I don't want to have a baby with a girl that's too dark because I don't want my kids to be too dark. So those same jokes that she may, hear, she may have heard that may have made her feel that she... Um, that her experience being lighter skin was better are the same jokes that darker skin women are also hearing on the opposite end of the spectrum that make black darker skin women feel um, inferior. So um, I just want to, you know, I just want us to, like she said, it, it, it is a conversation that black people need to have, but I do think that um, it needs to be an internal um, conversation because what I do not like and that's just me personally, is when we have these conversations among other races, um, you know, white, Hispanic, or whatnot, and they may not understand our struggle. And I feel like that opens up the, the ground for um, uninvited conversation when these struggles are Black struggles. 
Um, so that's my, that's my take on that. But in terms of pressure in the work environment, um, I would not necessarily say I feel pressure, but I, I have been told that I'm code switching. That's a terminology used when um, you work in a, um, a corporate America world where the, the way that you speak um, in a professional environment may be interpreted as you're being, you're speaking like a white person. Um, and that's not the case. When you're in a professional environment, you're supposed to speak professionally. And I'm not sure why that's associated with being white if you're speaking professionally. Um, on the opposite end, um, when I've been around a crowd of all white people and I'm there, I'm told, oh, you're an Oreo. You're dark on the outside, but you're white on the inside. I've been told that before. So um, I don't feel pressure. I feel the need to be myself, whether that is gonna be perceived as white or black, I'm always gonna be me. Um, but what I will say is that when I'm home amongst my family or my friends, um, I go back to, being West Indian. <laughs> That's always going to happen. So um, I may not speak West Indian when I'm um, at work, but I'm always going to be myself regardless of my whereabouts. I wouldn't say I've been pressured, but I can bring it back to the time when I was trying out for the basketball team in college. I was the only Black person on that team. So I was like, Dang, I can't, I don't want to start acting hood and then they're like because you know i'm a girl from the bronx so i'm young 18 years old around a whole bunch of white women that i've never experienced in my life so i did bring out the professional voice i never spoke to them like yeah yo what's up what's up son what up what up? i always spoke professionally around them and i don't think i should have to do that if they're they're my peers, you know what I'm saying? 